Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Meet the Alumni webinar with Rumiko Sayer. We're so pleased that you could join us today. I know we have alumni joining us from across the world. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're so glad you could join us and I'm sure you will be delighted to join us for an excellent webinar that we have in store for you with an esteemed alumna of the university, Rumiko Sayer. My name's Jack Massey. I'm Alumni Relations Manager at the University of Bradford and it is an absolute privilege to reconnect with members of our alumni community. Our alumni community go on to do incredible things and that's the idea of this webinar is to create opportunities to share those incredible stories and those experiences and those expertise with you, our alumni community. As I mentioned today, we are going to be hearing from Ruma Kosea. Uh, Ruma Kosea is president of Reach Alternatives, RAELS, an international NGO working in the field of conflict prevention, peace building and humanitarian assistance. Rumiko has an MA in Conflict Resolution from the Department of Peace Studies and the International Development in the Department of Peace Studies and International Development at the University of Bradford. And I'm pleased to share that we'll also be joined by Christoph Bluth. Christoph is a, a professor working in international relations and security at the university. He's joining us today and it's a timely opportunity to hear from Rumiko and Christoph because this year the Peace Studies and International Development Department is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Before we hand over to Christoph, I am going to tell you that we are going to be sending you an email straight after this webinar. It is going to contain the feedback form for today's event. We really, really appreciate your feedback about our events. Um, this is really the fuel for our event series and helps us ensure we are creating events which are useful and insightful and inspiring for you, our alumni community. I also include in that email some information about our careers offer, uh, a link for signing up to our volunteer bulletin and also a link to sign up to our alumni portal. This is uh, the second of a series of webinars we're running for our alumni this spring. The next one is on the 18th of April. It's at 11 o'clock till 12 o'clock in the morning uh, and it's with Dr Hugh Jones, lecturer in drug metabolism and medical biochemistry at the School of Pharmacy and Medical Sciences. So you'll be hearing more about that next week when we'll send a mailing out. So look out for that in your inbox and do sign up if you're interested. So I am excited to welcome Rumiko Sayer to this Meet the Alumni event today. Um, to let you know, you have a Q&A function on your screen. Um, you can put your questions in there. And I'd say there's no point that's too early for you to put in your questions. As soon as you have a question pop up, even if it's during Rumiko Sayer's presentation, please do put that in there and we will come to some of those questions at the end of the webinar. Also, just to make you aware, uh, Rumiko Sayer works in the field of conflict prevention, peace building, humanitarian assistance. And as such, there are some images in a presentation um, that show weaponry, soldiers, pictures of cities that have been impacted by conflict. Um, that is the extent of it. But I think it's important to flag that up for you at the beginning of the webinar. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Christoph Bluth, who's going to provide us with an introduction to Rumiko Sayer. Over to you, Christoph. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm lucky enough that I'm in Tokyo myself today. Uh, so um, uh, I think uh, I'm very glad to be present at this uh, at this webinar. And this is because um, we have this very special relationship uh, with our uh, uh, Japanese students, our Japanese alumni. Uh, every year I meet uh, persons who are wanting to come from Japan to study at, uh, in Peace Studies and International Development at Bradford. And they sometimes they ask me, you know, if I get this degree, can I join an NGO or can I join, work for an international organization? And of course, I always want to encourage them because it is encouraging that they want to do these, this kind of work which is really, really important for uh, the many of the issues that we are facing internationally today. And it's uh, it's unusual uh, that, that we have so many st students coming to Bradford who are so very committed to uh, develop a career in this kind of field. And so this is very exciting. Of course, Romico, who is going to be the presenter today, um, 
came to uh, came to Bradford and completed her her MA, and it's a shining example of our alumni in uh, becoming so deeply involved in these issues with the uh, 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 NGO that she is the, the the president of and that is working in, in in various parts of the world, including Afghanistan and Africa, and some very difficult and potentially dangerous parts of the world. And uh, I think it's an extraordinary thing that we have so many uh, former students from Japan who have um, developed these kinds of careers and are doing this kinds of extraordinary work. As part of our offering of um, teaching at Bradford, this is the kind of thing that we are looking for. We're looking for uh, committed students both for, to develop their academic expertise, but also to look at practical implications and our own staff. Uh, I have also, for the most part, a, a lot of act, uh, experience working in international organizations and NGOs. So I'm very happy uh, to to welcome her to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and I um, uh, really think she has very many important things to say to you, which I hope you will benefit from. And I will be around for the Q&A in case you want to ask me anything about Bradford University. But I'm very happy now to hand over to, to our speaker, uh, Rumiko Sayer. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction there, Christoph. Um, we're just waiting for Ruma Koseya to be able to uh, share screen. Um, I think we've had a couple of technical things there, but over to you, Ruma Ko. Hi, thank you for the kind introduction, Jack and Christoph. Hi, everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Rumiko Sea, and I graduated um, Bradford like 22 or 23 years ago. Gosh, time flies. But I've I recognize some of the some of the names from the participants. I'm glad that there are some alumni that I spent time together in Bradford joining today. Um, I'm not sure if you can you see the presentation. We can indeed, Rumiko. All set to go in terms of the presentation there. Hi. Okay. Um. So. I. I. Yeah. I. After, as as you may know, we normally spend like one year to obtain master's degree in UK. But uh, in my case, after finishing nine months course studies, I immediately went to Rwanda to initiate my work with an NGO. So I actually I was I was supposed to complete my dissertation, my dissertation in three months in Rwanda. But the books didn't arrive due to shipping trouble. So I actually obtained my degree a year later. So, and after I graduated, I continued working for some of the NGOs working in the area of peace building. And then I had an opportunity to work in Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire with UN peacekeeping mission. And actually, when I was in Bradford, you know, the when we talk about peace studies, the subject can be broad. So originally, I was intending to be specialized and to study on ex-combatants or violent extremism, but uh, I didn't find any professors who are specialized in. So eventually, I decided to focus more on post-conflict reconciliation in my dissertation because. Um, you know, when we talk about peace, um, I o I always wondered what will be the end goal of peace building work. And then at that time, when I was in, in my 
when I was still studying in Bradford, I thought, okay, eventually, if I talk about peace building, I have to know what will be the end goals. So it has to be reconciliation. So that's why I I, I decided to study on, um, I decided to focus on reconciliation. But then I, and then after I completed my dissertation, I, uh, I again uh, wondered what area of expertise I should have. And I wanted to do something different from other people because there are so many people, so many experts in the area of peace studies. And I found out that when I first arrived in Bradford, because in Japan at that time, like 20 years ago, we didn't have any peace studies, any um, university teaching directly on peace studies in Japan. We had some university talking about peace studies in theory, like, you know, after Second World War, Japan decided to, you know, become peaceful countries, so on, so from historical point of view, but there was no study. Um, there's no university, no department focusing on practical aspect of conflict resolution. And that's why I decided to study in Bradford. But then, and I thought I was kind of minority who managed to identify the subjects that no one, nobody else was doing in Japan. But then after arriving in Bradford, I realized there are so many people who are interested in, who are already, already working in the area of peace building and conflict resolution. And that was a good opportunity for me because I then, I got to know that, you know, then I really have to be specialized in something that nobody else is doing if we want to be a specialist in particular field. So my first area that I decided to measure in was uh, what is called um, disarmament, demobilization, and the reintegration of ex-combatants. And that was one of the big subjects in in the area of peace peace uh, peace building at that time, and then there was a serious shortage of experts. So I decided to measure in that area. So that's where I decided to work in uh, Western Africa to gain some experience. So, and that's how I did some of the field studies. Uh, voluntarily and I sent some, I drafted some reports and then I contributed to some of the uh, magazine in Japan or some, and then some people who read my reports called me and they asked me if I'm interested in working for the area of disarmament or demobilization or integration of ex combatants because they there was not so many people who was doing the work in that area. So my, and then after I worked in several US peace, UN peacekeeping mission, I also had an opportunity to work as a specialist of disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. We call it DDR, DDR in Afghanistan as a diplomat working for embassy of Japan. And that was, um, yeah, that was a um, very, um, some of the turning point for in my career, because until then, I was, I was more interested in working for the programming, program, programmatic aspect of peace building, like project design, program design, and project management, so on, so on. But then, after arriving in Afghanistan, I realized, you know, we need to talk about politics and policy. Especially working for the embassy, um, you know, there was uh, some negotiation and some coordination uh, to be done inside Afghanistan and also towards other countries like to US, UK, Canada, Germany. So that gave me some great opportunity to 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 actually to have hands-on experience in political negotiation. And also, uh, it also gave me some um, 
what I call um, some kind of some dilemma of some kind of a dilemma because um, because I when I was working for Afghanistan, I came to have some question on um, um, on the impact of my my work or our work as an international community. It was 20 years ago, but then at that time, we, I was working very hard, believing that what I'm doing will be leading to peace in Afghanistan. But then after working for one or two years, I came to feel that there is something wrong about what we are doing as an international community. Because we are working so hard, hoping that you know we are changing the Afghanistan, changing Afghanistan to be peaceful countries. But then there are some policies, some of the programs, some of the um, some of the, of the initiatives which are producing some you know counterproductive effects. But then, and then at first we thought you know. Taliban is gone, and the international community will be establishing the government of Afghanistan, and we are making, we are changing the society to ideal, uh, it, to to be um to be ideal manner. But then I, even me, when I at that time I was already I was still like 25, 26 years old, but then. Even myself, we are, even I came to notice that we are doing something, some, some mission impossible, and we are being so arrogant. And we are ignoring some of the local context, context and we are not really, we might be um, just advancing the way that maybe um, uh, we are we may be advancing towards some negative direction, but anyway. Um, so after working in Afghanistan for two years, I had a short pause because I I wanted to think what I want to do in that for in in the area of peace building. But then I started working again, and then this time in the area of uh, conflict prevention. Because you know, when I was working in Afghanistan, Sierra Leone, and Cote d'Ivoire for peace build, post-conflict peace building, um, at first I I thought that I'm doing totally right thing, but I came to see many issues, um, which is producing some trade-off at grassroots level. For example, um, this. Disarmament and the reintegration of combatants are important because, you know, during the peace agreement, we have to make some compromise in order to make sure that the uh, armed factions are disarmed and then agreeing on peace deals. Because if they know that they will be arrested, they, they will not give up their weapons. That's why um, almost all the peace agreement include the clause of giving amnesty to the former combatants in order for them to join the peace process. But then when we look at it, when we look at it from the victim's perspective, there are people who lost their families because of these combatants, but then these combatants are forgiven in the name of peace and come come home and they are enjoying their life and then my work as a for the my work of demobilization and reintegration can be seen as giving benefit to those ex-combatants because otherwise they'll be doing some harm harmful things to the peace process they'll just undermine peace process and but almost all the victims accept that peace deal because otherwise they will lose more families. So in order, to, and, but, in, but, in, 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 uh, but in fact, there are many people who wanted to have justice 
to these ex-combatants that if they pursue justice too much, they will lose peace. So there are lots of trade-off and compromise on the ground. And then I came to realize that as I work for the um, area of DDR. And, and I came to wonder what can be done and instead of going towards that, to, towards that direction. And then I came to realize that, that okay, uh, it, no matter how hard we work for post-conflict reconstruction or reconciliation or peace building, people who the lost lives will never come back. Then why don't we focus more on preventing the conflict or crisis or violence? We talk about you know, conflict prevention a lot for the last 30, 40 years from Butroskari and then all the, you know, agenda for peace, that there are not so much investment, not so much resources allocated, and there are not so much um, um, experts in the area of conflict prevention. So I decided to work for conflict prevention, and that's how I decided to join the current organization, uh, regional alternatives. We focus on conflict prevention and also preventing violent extremism, what we often call terrorism, and then other form of, other form of structural violence. And I'm just going quickly on the area of our expertise. And I had some choice. I had several choices whether I should I, I remain working for the UN or whether I remain working for for the government. But then I decided to work for a non-governmental organization because I thought it's more flexible. And then I just wanted to try how how far I can go uh, based on the the sense of dilemma and then based on you know my motivation that I want to really do something which is which I can believe that I'm doing the right thing 100 percent. So while our focus is conflict prevention, we we are also doing it in a way that can bring more sustainability on the ground. And then that's how, how we have this element of gender. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it later, but we train women uh, to be the community mediators and also the in the area of conflict prevention on the ground. While we focus on conflict prevention, we also have some work in the area of emergency aid, especially when it happens in the area that we operate. And one of the example is Afghanistan uh, in 2021, um, two and a half year, years ago. I think you still remember that all the all the big turmoil would happen, that the upsurge happened in Afghanistan when uh, U.S. troops and the international forces decided to leave Afghanistan and the Taliban advanced to Kabul and then the former, former government collapsed in one night. And I used to work in Afghanistan for uh, working for disarmament of former combatants. And at that time, I had this question that I, 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 I talked about. And then when this, um, this crisis happened in Afghanistan, I was like, oh my God, it happened. It happened. What we, have, what we were doing for 20 years in Afghanistan finally collapsed. And then, um, but at that time, my organization were not, was not working in Afghanistan. We used to work in Afghanistan for demining or training of former combatants, but then I had, we, we had handed over all the projects to other organizations already. But when this crisis happened two years ago, uh, I received many uh, uh, 
phone calls or emails or messages from former staff or women activists and other people who are hiding and who are, who are, be, who are at risk of being killed or being taken hostage or being captured by Taliban. And and actually, um, as I was working for um, Japanese embassy, some of the Afghan staff who used to work or who are still working for the foreign embassy who are targeted by Taliban for collaborating with the international community or international troops or international bodies. So um, several, I was still in touch with several former staff and then they, they contacted me saying that, you know, you know, my, my house was attacked and my, my wife and my children were also interrogated and asked, being asked to my whereabouts and I need help, so and so. And at that time, I, I never had any experience in ev evacuation of such emergency, but I, won't, but I couldn't ignore the messages from people that I used to work and and I also realized there are some people that I used to work in Afghanistan together. So some of the international staff who used to work for foreign media or BBC, Al Jazeera, or UN offices or foreign troops who were having the same um, anxieties. So we were we are kind of united. And then the people who used people who used to work in Afghanistan and those who those people who have someone that they want to save started exchanging information on how we can do it. And that's how I started evacuation and protection of people at risk in Afghanistan. At first, as individual. And one month later, we officially launched Project as Rails for evacuation. And then we received uh, lots of requests every day. And then even from the people that I never met, because there are so many people like former politicians or former women activists who are being targeted and they are hiding. But And then um, they somehow obtained my contacts and they're asking if I can do something. And then at first I contacted the Japanese government because Japanese government was supposed to do the evacuate. They, they, were, they had a plan of evacuating some Japanese who are remaining or some former embassy staff or those Afghans who used to work for Japanese organization. But then their evacuation mission failed. And also they put some harsh condition saying that, okay, those who used to work directly to Japanese embassy, they will include in evacuation list, but they have to leave their spouse. They have to leave their wives and children because there's no seat in Charter flight. When we, you know, I, I didn't even have to ask that, you know, many of my former staff couldn't leave their wives and husband knowing the Taliban will not guarantee their human rights. They will even not guarantee the rights of women to work or to study. So, of course, they were not able to leave their families. So I, um, I had to do our own evacuation and pro protection mission. We, I cannot talk in detail because there are lots of security issues involved, but um, so far up to now, we managed to evacuate 308 people to different countries that 
to like Germany, yeah, some of them in UK, in some of them Japan. Actually, I contact, I use, I use um, all my resources, all my networks that I can use. I contacted lots of MPs in different countries. I, yeah. And then I contacted lots of uh, government. And if, if there's any female athletes at risk, I contacted like Olympic committee, <laughs> whether they, there are some initiative of evacuating or supporting the at-risk athletes. And then also there are lots of journalists who are targeted. So literally, um, I was working like 20 hours a day, con keep on contacting people from people in Afghanistan who are at risk and also contacting different people in the world who may, who might be able to help accept them in their own countries. And also, um, as all of them, all of people at risk cannot stay at their home because their home are not known and targeted. We provided shelter and we also sent doctors, nurses to, to their shelters, to their, yeah, shelters. So, on. so, so we provided protection support to more than 1,000 people so far. And of course, they cannot work. And because they are hiding and they are, they don't have any money, so we are also supporting them in their livelihood until they manage to arrive in the final destination. And then, yeah, we managed to hear the good news from them, and then those people who managed to reach the final destination, and those families who managed to evacuate to Japan came visit us in our office. Uh, yeah, but this, these are the area of our work in humanitarian assistance. And of course, we also conduct other sort of humanitarian assistance in different countries, like in Syria, we provide food, shelter, psychosocial support to the displaced people. And also in South Sudan, we provide um, protection support for the victims or up to those at risk women and girls on gender-based violence. So, so. In Somalia, Kenya, we work in the area of conflict prevention and prevention of violent extremism. So um, we focus on, right now we work in different areas like Kenya, we finished almost all the work. We handed over our operation to the local communities. And we work in Africa, Middle East, Asia, yeah. So um, conflict prevention, it's it's not easy task. First, we first of all we have to identify and analyze the signals of conflict and violence in order for us to take action. Um, actually, almost all conflict and violence have some signals. It doesn't really start overnight. Um, even violent extremism like terrorism, it has signals or symptoms of the change, which we can notice if we have knowledge. And in case of inter-ethnic conflicts, there are some when the some of the signals can be, you know, the divorce rate increase between inter-ethnic marriages or the children start. Um, some start um, some discriminative action towards other children, like because they are influenced by adults or their parents, so on. So, and also for violent extremism, some of the symptom is that the is uh, the pathways for the youth to be recruited or to be influenced to have extremism mindset, like some of the signals uh, can be the, the, the particular youth who start watching YouTube every night on terrorist, ter particular violent extremism groups, or they start talking about some abusive or aggressive words, and they start having uh, some 
money while they do not work because they are sponsored by particular groups, so on. So there are some signals or symptoms in each country. And then, and then funny enough, um, it's a global, uh, it's, it is, the study shows that, you know, in many, in many cases, the people around these youth were managed to notice these signals, but they didn't know how to deal with it. You know, like family members, friends, or school teachers, they came to know that, okay, there is something wrong about this boy, this girl, but they, in, but in, in many cases, even whether it's in US, Europe, Africa, Asia, in, in most of the cases, they do not consult police because once they do it, these youth might be arrested or interrogated, or they may be put in a blacklist. Even if they were innocent. So in many countries, police or local government are not that much trusted. That's why many people just observe the situation for a while, and then this violent extremism uh, is advanced up to the critical stage in one year, and then people these youth start taking action, like they leave their home to do some terrorist attacks and so on. So, so um, we analyze, we identify these signals in depending on type of conflict, depending on type of violence, even the gender-based violence has some symptoms. So we identify and we also analyze what kind of solution or what kind of coping measures were more effective and which one was less effective effective so that we can make use of the result in our work. And we also train um, people in, in the community to be the community workers, to be the mediator, to prevent this recruitment, or when there are some, some youth who wants to leave that gangs or extremism groups, but they do not know how, then the people that we train can help them realize it. So we train, we select people from local community-based organization, local police, local school teachers, or school counselors, or people who have more access to such use, or people who are already close enough to such vulnerable people because, so that they can be an agent for change. And we also train uh, local police. The, the, the one of the problem is that com community members do not trust police much. So we, if we talk about collaborating with the police in initial stage, people will not accept it. So first, we focus on um, building trust between community members, like whether women use community elders. And then after several years, uh, we start training the local police. And then we just suggest, we suggest having some small collaboration so that people can have some um, good practice. And then people come to know that there are some police officers who are trained and who wants to be helpful. And then the rumors start spreading around. And then uh, in almost all the projects we conducted in Eastern Africa, we managed to bring some sustainable mechanism whereby the community members, local administration, local peace committee, and then local police come meet once a month to exchange ideas on how to build, how to maintain the peace and how to prevent and how to resolve the violences or conflicts or troubles or some of the rape cases or gender-based violence in the area. And there are some initiatives that managed to prevent 
the recruitment of terrorism, uh, recruitment of uh, some gangs or terrorist attacks, and then they are still continuing this initiative. And we also we also focus on training youth to be the agent for change because you know um, youth can be seen as a main perpetrators of violences, but they are also marginalized from decision making process. So um, if we manage to create role models in the areas in the in such areas, they, they are people who used to be suspicious about this peace building initiative come to realize it's possible because the the one of the youth who used to stay with them or actually the, the boy sit the boy with microphone on right the right hand side he used to be a he used to be the member of one of the terrorist group called al shabaab which is uh, operating widely in Somalia and Kenya but the, he managed to escape he managed to leave the group with our project. And then he volunteers, he volunteered to be the community workers to, 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 to work with us. But then he himself is becoming a role model for many people. He talked about how he was asked to join and how he managed to escape, so on so. And another area we are focusing on is uh, women, peace, and security. That means, you know, women tend to be seen as a victim in the conflict. Like, you know, women tend to be seen vulnerable to gender-based violence. And it, while it's, it is a fact, we also need to realize that there is a potential that women can demonstrate. And there's a study. Um, Study shows that the you know, peace agreement whereby women are actively involved as a mediator, observer, witnesses, or signature or, or signers increase the success rate of that agreement by 35%. But in reality, only 9% of all peace process involve women. So if we involve, and it's also about representative, you know, uh, women occupy half. 50%, half 50% of the whole population, but you know, this representative representation is low. So the so th these peace agreements do not really reflect the voice of those vulnerable and then so um so if we manage to make sure that voice of women and youth who are marginalized from decision-making process and political and policy, polit from political policy level included in all the peace process, then we can make the world a bit more peaceful. So that's why we also focus on training women and female leaders at both community level and then now, from for the next couple of years, we are really focusing on um, um, bringing more opportunities, providing, not providing, we are making sure that women are represented in also at political and policy level of peace process and peace building. And that's one of the areas that we are focusing on right now. Yeah. So um, actually today I'm talking about um, my experience, but actually this experience is all all the all all of the success are due to the people who work on the ground, the people at the community, and I also I often get some get yeah people sometimes ask me why I can continue this work of peace building because it looks so hard. And, and my answer is that, you know, actually, okay, there are lots of problems in the world, but, you know, when I realize that I'm, I'm no longer useful in that particular area because there are people who, who, who are trained already 
managing their own society to be peaceful after several years of our work, then I realized that, you know, there are already people with a little opportunity who can change their own life, their own community, their own society. Then why, why not we continue? So all of these successes are as a result of people that we work with on the ground. And then also, as you may know, the world is full of, still full of war and crisis. So our work uh, is not at all over, lots to be done, but I'm not trying to be, I'm trying not to be too pessimistic because you know there are areas that we haven't done enough, like training, women training youth and making sure these people who are not really in the central of peace agreement, peace building process can still change, uh, can still bring the positive effect to what's happening in the world. So that's how I'm looking at my work and hoping that, you know, someday, this world peace building or my my work itself become totally useless so that uh, that's the day that uh, that could be the end of my 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 work but then i also uh, i also i'm also motivated when i see the people that i train like 10 years ago or 5 years ago are already becoming the leader in their own community. Actually, you know, I we started our work in Kenya like 13 years ago. And then we already we are already scaling down our work because the people that we train is already taking over. And then uh when I went back to Kenya last year, the the very first group of youth that we train, like 10 or 11 years ago, one of them are uh, being the host of TV program talking about peace to the children. Another youth who the, another youth was becoming the hero in their own community. Every time he walks around, kids will be just chasing him around and then calling him like heroes. So when I look at it, you know, I was like, okay, maybe I did good thing. There are lots of negative news in the world. You know, that you know, war becomes the news. But peace does not become news much. So we have to spread more positive aspect of how we manage to build peace and uh, so that we can share such good practice to, to make the world better and to take, to take action instead of just looking at the crisis. Okay, so I'm talking too long and thank you so much. I'm just, I'm just stopping here. Thank, thank you. you so much, Rumiko. Uh, thank you. That was uh, such a fascinating and insightful presentation there. And uh, thank you so much for your honesty around your journey as well. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all attendees when I say it's very impactful to hear about not only the impact of your work, but your journey through it. Thank you so much for that. Um, attendees, you can post a question in the Q&A. We've already had a couple more. We'll probably be able to get through two or three questions here. Um, so do pop your questions in. I'm going to share the first one with you, uh, Rumiko, which is from Edward Rhodes. Edward has observed that one thing that was said about the Northern Ireland peace process was that it was not just about disarming weapons, but disarming minds. Is a change in mentality an important part for your work in protection? I think it's something you touched on with the, the youth and changing that mindset, but how much of um, your work involves changing mentality and changing people's mindsets? Yeah, actually, um, the changing the mindset is also a big aspect. Uh, why changing their, especially when we, yeah, we also need to change their economic aspect. Like they used to, work as a combatant, they used to fight and got money. But then the war is over. People are talking about peace process, but then that means these combatants become jobless. So they cannot appreciate peace. And so 
we have to provide them some way to survive in a peaceful society. That's one thing. And that's how they manage to appreciate the peace itself. And then that also impact affect their mindset. And also um, it's quite important why we should not um, dishonor too much on you know, former combatants, because that's also against the reconciliation process. Uh, we really need to take a balance. You know, we have to also talk talk to them like, OK, what they used to do is bad things. But you know, there are some people who are forced to do so because they are kidnapped as a child soldier, so and so. But we have to take some balance between that. Yeah, but also, yeah, especially the most important thing is to make sure these combatants understand that it's the, the society itself is becoming peaceful means if they manage to appreciate the peace then that's how they their life can be officially changed Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a very powerful example. And, and something that struck to me in your presentation was about the compromise and uh, uh, addressing that root cause takes you down that path where, you know, it might not be ideal, but it it, it is addressing that root cause. I've got another question here from Etsuko Yamada, who says, thank you very much for sharing your firsthand experience with us. I used to work in MINUSCA a mission in the Central African Republic as a political affairs mm. officer. And after that, in the next duty station, I had burnout symptoms. How do you manage stress in a high stress country? How did you make a clear boundary between the private part uh, of your life and your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And especially after working in Afghanistan, I had a serious burnout. And at that time, I stopped working for I don't know, six months. And I decided to do something totally different. And then I I, I, I thought, OK, I'm going to study French. I wanted to learn French for a long time. But initially, originally, I wanted to go to Côte d'Ajour in France. But then a friend of my former colleague from UN, who are from France, said, OK, you should come to Côte d'Ivoire because that's where I work now. It sounds similar, but it's called Cote Cote d'Ivoire is you know Western Africa. I I went there, and I managed to learn French. But then there was a UN peacekeeping peacekeeping mission, and I was recruited there, so I started working there. And then, and right now, um, I'm trying to create some time, um, to focus on. Um, my privacy, um, pri my 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 segregate my <laughs> time for private and official. I I try to watch some comedy movie com comedy movies or some program when I'm working in hardship countries. And and also especially after now I have uh, two children and it became it became much easier for me to separate my private life to my to my work time and I focus I try to focus more time with my children and I, I I try to forget my work and that's how I'm also trying to that's how I also manage my my stuff because some of the stuff can be can have burnout out because they focus too much on on work so I we they need to take some leaves regularly like twice and once in a two, two months time so on so we make it compulsory so that they can change their mindset thank you so much it, it's just those boundaries to to have in terms of the leave and um yeah i can also, imagine yeah, having a role oh, like yeah. yours it, it it really does yeah, yeah. can can pull you in because it's something that you're so passionate about but it, it's it's good advice yeah, especially when I was young. <laughs> but recently, I do not have so much burnout um, symptoms. So now I am gradually merging this work and private. For example, those people whom we supported evacuation from Afghanistan to Japan, 
we had some family reuni reunion between these evacuated family from Afghanistan with my children and so that we can get to know each other. So it's not like I help them and they are helped, but you know, it's equal mm -hmm. um, relationship. So, you know, it, it they may like... help me <laughs> someday. <Yeah. laughs> Families come up a few times and it sounds like you mentioned that was one of the things that helped you keep that boundary was around and around family there. And um, we've got another question. I believe this one is from Thomas Knight. Um, and Thomas has asked, he said, you mentioned that you began first began studying. Sorry, you mentioned that when you first began studying, there were few universities in Japan offering peace studies. How has this changed in Japan and elsewhere? Are peace and conflict studies becoming more prominent? I think Jack, Jack can, is more familiar with this, but yeah, I feel there are lots of Japanese university offering peace studies now. So I think which is a good, which is a positive change. And then there's some professors who study, who graduated Bradford and teaching peace studies in Japan right now. So yeah, so I think it's a it's a great improvement, and I think we should really appreciate that. And actually, when I was doing my master's degree in Bradford, there are some students from US who came to study in Bradford, which was a surprise to me because, you know, in, in US, there are already some peace, some department teaching the conflict resolution. But then they, they were saying that they wanted to have more different aspect in UK. So, so. It's been so interesting um, over the last year or so since I've been working at Bradford to see how many um, amazing alumni we have in Japan of the, the Department of Peace Studies and International Development. Um, and, and I can really see that it is proliferating in that sense as well. Um, Rumika, have you got time for one or two more questions? Yeah, sure. Excellent. Well, we'll, we'll finish on the next two. So um, this one's from Andrew. As a follow on from the root cause topic that we discussed earlier with with Northern Ireland, how can governments stop reacting against symptoms and focus on the root causes? Is that root is that a lost cause itself in the modern world? Mm. <laughs> good, good question. And then, yeah, that's how we managed to have. That's what we are trying challenging right now to create linkages, more direct linkages between community level and policy or political level. And actually there are some people that we trained at grassroots level are now become are now being selected at local government or some some of the the decision making process, which is a positive changes. And I think that's quite important because they know how they can maintain, how hard it is to build peace on the ground. And, you know, so if we manage to have more representation of civil, from people, from civil society group and from youth, women involved in, in the government decision making process, that's uh, something that we can make some positive changes. And then that's what I'm trying, we are trying in where we work in Africa, Asia, Middle East, but also in Japan. And right now I'm also becoming the advisor of uh, Japanese foreign ministry in the area of women, peace and security and other aspect, because simply there are not so many experts in the area. So uh, I think it's some of the common tendency, but and at the same time, I find quite a few experts in peace, peace building involved in government decision making process in Norway, Finland, Sweden, and then also is civil society groups. And that's something that we should also follow and then to make sure that you know these voices are reflected in government uh, policies. And actually um, there are some people in the government or people in the Politician that who are seriously seeking um, advice on how we should do something practical in, for example, in Palestine and other part of the world. So, but you know, when they cannot have anybody who can advise on that and who have expertise on that, they just cannot make take any action and they 
they are overwhelmed overwhelmed by other issues. So that's that's sometimes it's lack of their their interest, but some but sometimes it's lack of their networks and their lack of their expertise. So that's what we are trying to bridge the gap. It's fascinating to hear about those countries where they offer a good model in terms of the expertise being linked to those centers of power. So thank you so much for sharing those. We'll finish on one question here. So this is from Kenny and I know Kenny, you've got two questions here, but I think with an eye on the time, we'll, we'll need to just stick with one. But it, I think it's a lovely question to end on. Kenny starts off by saying, thank you very much for sharing your stories and experiences. They'd like to hear a bit more around this first point that they've shared. It sounds like you already had some uh, a strong passion for working in the field around uh, a strong, it sounds like you already had a strong passion for working in the field of peace building when you started your MA programme at Bradford. What hasn't changed since then? And what has changed through your experiences and practices so far? So I guess broadly, since you, you finished uh, your MA programme at Bradford, what has and hasn't changed in your experiences and practices? Okay, yeah, actually my, the, the reason why I started working in there what I what the reason why I was interested in peace was because of the genocide in Rwanda. At that time, I was at, at high school, and then I was wondering why it's happening. How come we cannot stop it? But then I had so many questions, but I didn't have any answers. Then I started working in the ground on the ground, and I came to know why and how it happens. So that's the area that I came to know. But then the there's but, but I, I'm still endeavoring finding out the answers on how we can prevent it, how we can address it and resolve it better. So um, that's something that's uh, still in my mind. And actually, I until I came, came to see that what happened in Rwanda, I was always complaining about my, my life, like, okay, we are, I'm not from rich family, and then the, when I look at the politicians, they are just constantly yeah, only thinking about themselves. There's lots of corruption in Japan, so and so. But then I look at people in Rwanda, and then I, I found out, you know, maybe the the system on how this crisis, how the society is formed, how the people at the community level is not reflected, may be similar. No matter how you know the seriousness is quite different, but I found out the system might be kind of similar, and then that became the passion to myself because people in these war zones um, taught me that you know I what I was complaining about is just a maybe something that I can change on my own, but there are some people who cannot change on their own. So they can they they taught me how the world is formed. So I want to return them something from what I found out. So that is kind of passion that still stay within me. And then there are still lots of changes I sh we should make and lots of things that I am not being able to do, but that's something that I want to continue um, endeavoring. Thank you so much, Rumiko. I think that's a, a wonderful question to, uh, to and an answer to finish on because it speaks so much to your journey. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. It was wonderful to hear there how that issue you saw and the challenge you saw and the thing you wanted to change led to those questions of why and how. And I think I speak on behalf of um, my colleagues at the University of Bradford when I say that even though we've been just one part of your journey, the fact that we were able to part in, play a part in your journey in, in finding those answers is, is a true honour. Um, and, and it just is a reminder of why, you know, knowledge and insight and that desire to make a difference really matters. So I'm feeling very inspired as we finish this webinar today. I'm sure I speak on behalf of our alumni as well when when I say say that as well. Um, is there anything you'd like to share before we finish today? I appreciate it's it's nine o'clock in the evening, um, just gone past nine o'clock in the evening uh, in Japan. But is, is there anything you'd like to share before we finish? I'm fine, but uh, I really want to link up with uh, all the alumni that are uh, attending and who are part of this network so that uh, we can, together, we can make things better. And yeah, and then um, 
Yeah, my family is waiting, but actually my husband is also an alumni of Bradford somehow. So <laughs> he appreciates that uh, I have this opportunity to to, to talk, uh, talk here today. So thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Rumiko. And um, we will leave it at that for today, folks. Please do look out for that email where we share the link to the feedback form, to those links around how you can engage with us at the University of Bradford as alumni. But for now, I'll just say thank you for attending. Thank you so much to Rumiko Sayer for sharing her experiences with us. Uh, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much and hope to connect with you soon. Thank you. Thank you for organising and thank you.